All right, now we're joined by Andre Taylor and Leslie Cushman, who are here to tell us to vote yes on Initiative 940. So go ahead with up to five minutes to tell us why to vote yes. Okay. Well, first, we thank you for having us here tonight. Um, I-940 is, uh, many of you signed this. We got over close to 360,000 signatures, which we delivered to the Secretary of State on December 28th. And, um, was before the legislature for a while, and now it's gonna be on the November ballot, and we're really excited about it. We think um, and firmly believe that I-940 is good for everybody. It's for a safe Washington. It has the support of law enforcement. We're really pleased that um, King County Sheriff Mitzi Jo Hanknick has endorsed it. We have the endorsement of the Black Law Enforcement Association of Washington, uh, former Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper, and uh, Jim Fusel, is that right? Um, the law enforcement uh, action partnership is also endorsed and um, while it's nothing we can prove we got the signatures of many law enforcement during the process and a lot of dialogue with law enforcement during the process the main goal of i-940 is to change police culture and uh, address it through a multi-pronged effort of training and accountability it has fair processes for police and it addresses emerging issues that we have seen in Washington State and across the country around violence de-escalation and mental health issues and um, the use of deadly force. I'll, I'm gonna quickly tell you what it includes and then Andre's gonna talk and we will go back and forth. We, we have been working together since uh, May of 2016. So the initiative has um, set up a really interesting process. It, um, mandates the it, it, it will be the first in the we will be the first in the nation to mandate violence de-escalation training and mental health training we also are going to be mandating first aid training and requiring the provision of first aid at the scene which is um, important and you'll learn from us tonight that these are issues that have bubbled up from incidents with police and from what families have learned and what we have learned by interviewing families that, uh, from their um, interactions with police. A core part of I-940 is it removes the de facto immunity. Out of um, all 50 states, um, Washington is the only state in the nation that has a virtually uh, virtual immunity from prosecution. Um, since 1986, only one prosecution and it was in an acquittal. And uh, data-wise, I think facts are important for the context and to shape what we're talking about. Um, since um, 2000, over 300 um, Washingtonians have been um, killed by police. And about a third of those have been experiencing a mental health crisis of some sort. And um, we find some racial disparities, um, some disparities related to poverty, um, LGBTQ, and uh, so overrepresentation of, in the data. In the nation, um, Washington is one fifth of, one fifth, ranks one fifth, fifth place, not one fifth, that's a fraction. <laughs> it's in fifth place, uh, which is not a good place to be in high, which makes it high in a number of deaths from police. Last year there were, the Washington Post keeps a good count of it and they, they uh, track 38 people were killed last year. You want to talk a little bit about the initiative? Yes, let me give you a little backstory on uh, how I came in, uh, uh, to this space. My brother was killed in 2016 by the Seattle Police Department. And um, I'm from Seattle, but I was in Los Angeles at the time. And um, of course, I'm an African-American male. I realize that this has been going on in our communities for a very long time. But what I saw is that a lot of times when these uh, police use, uses of deadly force happen, that from my community there had been a reaction immediately. And a lot of times those reactions are not positive because of the historic trauma that people are experiencing. And um, I decided that I didn't want to go at it like that with the reaction. I rather wanted to respond to the situation to control the narrative, because a lot of times what happens when there's a reaction that is bad, you lose the narrative. Uh, because whatever happened with the initial incident 
there, there's a deflection from that to the activity of the community at that time. So when I came back home uh, the day after my brother was killed, which was February 22nd, I came back home, he was killed on the 21st of February 2016. Um, I sat down with the chief of police at the time, Captain O'Toole, and I told her, I says, you know, I know that I can't bring my brother back, but I'm willing to work with you still so that we together can reduce the incidences of violence in our communities. And that shocked her because she was waiting for a reaction. And, um, and I felt that in order for us to have a comprehensive conversation with community, law enforcement, uh, politicians, that a space had to be created that hadn't been created. When my brother was killed, we didn't know what to do. We were devastated. My family members were turned on one another, just trauma, just didn't know what to do. So I created Not This Time, my organization, grassroots, because I never wanted another family to have to go through that. Uh, and you know, so what we do is, when a family experiences a tragedy, we go to that family, we, we cover them with a legal team, with other family members that have gone through this process so they can feel that they have some type of support. And we tell them, because we know it's difficult to grieve and fight at the same time, that you grieve, we'll fight for you, and when you are ready to speak for your family member, we create a platform for you. So, um, so in that, holding that space for families, which my organization has probably 10 families that we represent, uh, Charlene allows is probably the, one of the most high profile cases in our state. The moment the day she was killed, they called us and we were able to put a legal team and support around them. And not just that, because we explained to the families that this is an ongoing process. In the beginning, everybody's interested in what's happening to you, but people tend to fall off after a while. And we've committed to stay there through the whole process of that grieving and whatever it takes for that family to go through. Financial needs, and trauma, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, having some type of outlet for their trauma. So we also started finding out about the, walk, the law in Washington State. And when I came back, I couldn't believe uh, that we had the most, well, Amnesty International says we have the most restrictive law in the nation. And I didn't understand why. When they begin to explain to me through some attorneys and all that in our state we have to prove that a person, a officer had malice before we can hold them accountable, we can't charge them. I said, well, can you unpack that for me? Well, they said, well, let me explain to you like this. You gotta prove within the officer's mind what he was thinking. And I said, how could you prove that? They said, that's a case in point. You can't. I said, you gotta prove what he was thinking? Yes. So that's why we haven't had any officers held accountable here, you know? And I felt that if we created this space and begin to educate the community weekly, we wanted to educate the community, bring law enforcement, families, and community together, and politicians so that they can come before community, explain to community their responsibility, and at the same time, educate the population about how we change things. Not with a reaction, but with a response through policy and legislation. That's what got us involved, my wife and I, and our family. So 940 came from that grassroots movement. And then we began to reach out uh, to other communities of color, natives, Latinos, Asian Pacific Islanders, and explain to them we've been dealing with these situations by ourselves without any success. We need to come together. We need each other more than ever now. So the beautiful thing about 940, it, it is the largest people of color led coalition in the history of our state. It is beautiful for people to come together. So we have white people, black people, Asian people, straight, gay, everybody has come together because I ultimately believe the only way that we can change things, not only here but for our country, is that we all come together. And evidence of that is when we provided 360,000 signatures to the legislators and they only asked for 260,000. When we raised $1.4 million, when we had 700 volunteers from around the state. I often said when I, I'm on TV and people are interviewing me and they're asking, how did you do it? I say, I want the country to understand that the only way we could have done it is that every single one of us come together. And that's how we've been able to achieve this success. And we believe with that same narrative, not only can we change things for Washington State, I'm glad we're in Washington State because I believe we have the genius here to continue to lead the rest of the nation. So with that being said, 
This will be the first accountability measure in the nation. And I believe other nations, I mean other, uh, other uh, states, kind of like the 2003 marriage equality that Massachusetts brought forward when it wasn't popular, but they had vision and they stepped forward and did the right thing. And after they stepped forward with that vision, the rest of the states kind of followed suit. This is what we have here in 940. Not only help for us, but a way of relief for other states that are looking for a way out. That's what 940 has created. So now we'll have to follow up questions. I have one, Ben had one. Um, so what we'll be voting on was the original text from the original initiative of the legislature, correct? Yes. Can you briefly describe what happened in the legislative session and then what happened with the recent Supreme Court decision? Well, let me give you, then I know Leslie can be more technical. <clears throat> we always were prepared for the ballot. We never even felt one time that legislators would be interested. I believe they were interested by the amount of people that they seen involved in this change and they wanted to be a part of that change. But from the beginning, we wanted to go straight to the ballot because we had three polls, 70 plus percent saying that the state, people in the state saying we need this change. So we were encouraged about the ballot. But when we had an opportunity, only because we won, law enforcement never proposed to change anything. You had to win first, right? And, and through winning, that created a space that law enforcement can come to the table. And we thought it would be a good idea to bring law enforcement to the table and hear them out. We heard them out and we found some areas there that we felt, hey, that seems sensible. And we were willing to go with that if we can get the support. One of the things, I'm definitely to cover this more than I, one of the things law enforcement explained to us is that, listen, um, if an officer goes through this process and he is found not guilty, don't you think it would be fair for then the state to pick up those charges instead of that being his responsibility? Reimbursement. Reimbursement. Indemnification. Yeah. I said, that's fair. I could do that. I think we all could do that. So 3003 was some of those consensus that were just simply fair. But the foundation and the root of 3003 was still 940 all along, right? So that's my explanation. That's perfect. We uh, totally support 940 and uh, think it's good policy. It's thoughtful. It's well written. It is, uh, if you're a, a geek, it's written, it's based on best practices from um, law enforcement leadership and from the uh, Obama's 21st Century Task Force on Policing and uh, guiding principles for use of force from a police executive research forum. So the grassroots organization, uh, we knew we weren't experts. So we use the, ex the expert material and guidelines from law enforcement. It, it reflects their best practices. Yeah. Um, how would this make it easier to prosecute police officers who murder people? Well, let me clarify that because that is a law enforcement narrative. It will not make it easier, it make it possible. Right now it's not even possible, not because I'm saying it, because the data proves that it hasn't been pro possible in over 30 years. So it makes it possible to prosecute officers. Right now, we're not even there. That's the difference. So law enforcement narrative is easier. Ours is, no, it didn't make it possible. How does it make it possible? Do you want to explain that? Well, right now, as Andre explained, the malice clause is a, a barrier. Uh, it's virtually impossible to prove that, as, as we can tell from the data. It, there just hasn't been a conviction. There have been cases that we know are extreme and unjustified. Um, people have to go to federal court right now to get any justice. Um, the killing of Leonard Thomas in fights, he was unarmed, a SWAT team um, shot him while he was holding his son. He was in a mental health crisis. There was no, no need to shoot Leonard Thomas. The family was awarded $13 million, $15 million. They just settled for $13 million. So we, we can't bring that case to our court because of that. Otto Zem in Spokane, he was um, an adult, uh, intellectually, uh, had an intellectual disability. Do you want me to, can I go? Okay. Um, and um, he was uh, brutalized by a police officer. Um, and uh, they had it written in federal court in one. And uh, there are other situations. John T. Williams, John T. Williams is, is, is the classic case yeah. for, for the Seattle area. Um, 
So well, let me, we let don't me. expect, we don't know if our our goal it really isn't prosecution. It's the rule. It's so our, so it's, it's fairness, accountability. Minimum. Yep. Does and it just take out the malice of forethought, or does it replace it with a different standard? We take out malice, okay. and we define good faith as in the, uh, under two standards. It has a subjective standard, so it still looks at intent, and you have to, if you establish um, sincere intent to use deadly force in good faith, and then an objective reasonable standard, which is um, what other we find in other states. Okay. So, so let, let me, it's let in me, place in 27 other states. Let me, let, me, let me just talk about John T. Williams for you. It's, it's a very high profile, profile case here. He was a native carver, he was known as man, he made his art appearing as well. Uh, an officer by the name of M. Burke came up to John Williams and uh, was telling him to put down the knife and M. Burke was, uh, John T. Williams was walking ahead of him and in a matter of four seconds, M. Burke shot and killed John T. Williams. So let me tell you the difficultness of the law as it is today. Law enforcement found that M. Burke violated police policy. They found that. But because the malice clause in our law, we couldn't bring them up on any type of accountability charges. So even though a cop, so in this state right now, no matter how bad an officer's behavior is, we cannot hold them accountable because of malice. And that's why M. Burke was not held accountable, even though he was found to have violated police policy. So the difference is, is that when malice is taken out, then the circumstances can come into play. We don't have a barrier of malice before you can get to what was going on in the circumstances. You can never get there because you gotta overcome that de facto immunity of malice. So I've sat down with, um, and I'm sure he doesn't mind me saying this, we sat down with um, the Attorney General Bob Ferguson, and, and he was explaining to me that when this law was instituted in 1986, that it was purposed to be the way that it is, that an officer would only be found, uh, that he would never be criminally found, but only civilly charged. It was created to do exactly what it's doing. And that really pissed me off, excuse me if I can say it, <laughs> when he told me that. That narrative that I was carrying before, the respond and not react, I almost lost it after he said that. <laughs> My understanding is that Washington State is the outlier. You said Amnesty International said we had the most uh, restrictive force. Yeah. Re yeah. And and so they call they called it in their uh, interview the most egregious. Egregious. Yeah. yeah. So this this is their. Report. I'm not understanding what the controversy is bringing Washington State to norms. Like if every other state does not have the malice clause, why is it an issue for Washington State to get rid of it? That, the people support it. it right. I think it's going to pass. So it's not going to be an issue. Well, the issue has been because if you are law enforcement out there and you understand that type of immunity, uh, as a law enforcement officer, you probably want to keep that. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's the issue. So we have lots of law enforcement support yeah. that, that knows this is the right way to go. It's, it might be politics that's that's doing this. I talked to Sue Rar uh, one time, we brought her to our organization and um, explained to Sue Rar what's going on here. And um, she said- Do you know who Sue Rar is? Former King County Sheriff. Yeah, and she's the head of the Criminal Justice Training Commission. Training. She'll oh, be yeah, implementing all the training mm -hmm. curriculum and hours in here. So Sue, Sue said that, that they are scared of I said, well, in 1986, when this law was instituted, the law before 1986 was that an officer could shoot a fleeing felon in the back. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. So even though officers might have been afraid of 1986, it was still the right thing to do to change the law, right? So you're saying that they are afraid again, as if that is a reason why we should not have progression in this area, that we need it real bad, right? So. Whether an officer is fearful or not, it is the right thing to do because no one, absolutely no one should be above the law. So we are about at a time. If you guys want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. I'll be 15 seconds. Fair enough. Seconds. Fair enough. Mm. I want to encourage uh, everyone to vote yes on I-940. It is really sound policy. 
it's had a lot of bidding. We have some endorsements of significant um, uh, people in the state that uh, we look up to. We have organizations like Moms Rising uh, that supports League of Women Voters, that supports, we. it's grassroots, it's community-based, and uh, I think it's fair for everyone. Excellent. Um, we have the genius, the fortitude, the activism, and the right people for change in this state for the rest of the country. The country is screaming for help, and I think we need to step forward and be what we say we are, that progressive state that we are, and bring forth some leadership in this country, like Massachusetts did in 2003. I think it's our time to do it again. Thank you. Thank you.